Hello, good evening everybody and thank you for joining us for this event on the topic of Arts for Social Change hosted by Cardboard Citizens. My name is Matthew Zia, I'm a trustee of Cardboard Sits and Artistic Director of Actors Touring Company. Uh, a few housekeeping notes before we start. So live captions are available for this event. Click the CC closed captions button or click on the link in the chat for a fully adjustable page of captions. Enter any questions that you've got for our panelists in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, ready for our Q&A section towards the end of the event. And then there's an option to upvote questions that you'd most like to be answered. Uh, and you can also ask questions anonymously. The event is being recorded and will be available on YouTube afterwards. Uh, and the biggest thing to say is thank you all for joining. So Cobble Citizens is a registered charity and theatre company with a 30 year history of building creative communities to explore issues related to homelessness, and affect social change from an arts-based, experience-led approach. 2021 is a milestone year for Cardboard Citizens as they celebrate 30 years and welcome their new Artistic Director and Joint CEO, Chris Sonix. I'll ask the panel to introduce themselves now, starting with Chris. So um, if everybody could please tell the audience who you are, the organisation you'll be representing during the discussion, and give a physical description of yourself. Mr Sonix, you need to take yourself off mute as well. I think I'd have figured this out after a year of being on Zoom, but apparently not. Hello, I am uh, I'm Chris Sonix, uh, the new artistic director of Carbal Citizens. I uh, have a beard and I've got a, a colourful scarf on. Super, thank you. Uh, Shanine Bethina. Hi everyone, <clears throat> I'm Shanine Bethina. I'm the creative director for uh, Coventry, UK City of Culture. Um, uh, I'm joining you today uh, from my home. Um, I've got short dark hair and I've got a little nose stud and then it might twinkle on Zoom, I don't know, uh, but it's lovely to be with you. Brilliant, thanks Shanine. Uh, Aaron Cesar. Good evening everyone, I'm Aaron Cesar, the founding director of Delphina Foundation. I'm sat in London in the library of Delphina Foundation. I have short, very curly hair um, and a goatee and I'm wearing a tweed jacket, although my age looks, you know, uh, it's in very much in contrast to this jacket, my casting choices. <laughs> um, I should also add that I'm on the jury for the Turner Prize this year. Great, thank you. And our final panelist is Francis Nielsen. Hi, uh, my name is Frances Nielsen, uh, but people call me Frankie. Um, I probably should have put Frankie Nielsen because I do prefer it. I'm the Cultural and Creative Director for the Herbert Art, well, the Herbert Art Gallery, but also Cultural Commentary Trust, um, of which Herbert is part of that portfolio. Um, I uncharacteristically have my hair scraped back in um, some kind of messy bun, um, glasses, and a 1960s type black polo neck, rocking the 60s look, I think. <laughs> Thank you. I should also give a description myself. Um, so similarly bearded, like Chris, uh, wearing a red stripy jumper, vertical stripes, not horizontal, because that would make me look like Dennis the Menace. Um, so this conversation is an opportunity to explore and celebrate the power of arts and culture for social change during a landmark year for Cardboard Citizens, the Turner Prize and the City of Coventry. Cardboard Citizens celebrates 30 years of creating theatre to challenge perceptions of homelessness, including co-producing a musical with Coventry City of Culture Trust and the Belgrade Theatre. The 2021 Turner Prize, hosted at the Herbert Gallery, has a strong arts for social change focus, and Coventry is, of course, the UK City for Culture for 2021. And their manifesto, Coventry Moves, has a strong focus on the power of arts and culture for social change. Um, so it'd be great to hear from you all quite quickly. Uh, just to get a taste of what this central theme means to you and your organisations in 2021. So uh, I guess we'll we'll go in the same order that we started with. So Chris, I'm going to go uh, first on a regular basis, which means that I can't like just coast on everybody else's glory, can I? That's was that meant, Matthew? I'll, I'll, I'll revise <laughs> the order. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, arts and social justice, obviously. Carbo Citizens has a as a as a big history, being set up set up 30 years ago. Uh, to make theatre with um, and for um, people with lived experience of homelessness uh, with, the, with the idea that um, using theatre can, can change uh, societal legislation and, and people's well-beings. Um, obviously in this, in this uh, new year, it's, it's been a new year under me and also the new year under, under sort of COVID restrictions, it's become even more paramount to start 
understanding who are the who are the people that we are we want to talk to and who do we want to uh, create work with and you know the situations worldwide seem like uh, it's only going to get worse so we need to really double down on the work that we're doing and and really target lots of lots of different streams of, of engaging with people great thank you Shanine Hi, yeah, so I think um, with, with Coventry City of Culture, um, we very much set out back in 2018 when I first started to really make sure we were creating a programme that was inclusive for as many different citizens um, in our city as possible, um, really reflecting the very different perspectives, um, but putting citizens in charge of the storytelling, really. Um, and I think when you put citizens in charge of the storytelling, instead of fairy tales, you get the real stuff. Um, and actually that's what we wanted to look at. We wanted to make sure that, of course, we were delivering a program full of joy and celebration and, and, um, and civic pride in, in Coventry as a great city, but also a city like many other cities that's got lots of issues and problems um, where people are really struggling and having a hard time and it's not their fault. Um, and also people arriving in the city from lots of different places for lots of different reasons. Uh, some people without homes, many people with mental health issues, uh, lots of young people struggling to adapt um, to life in the 21st century. Um, and many people who've traveled here who are really struggling. Um, we've got um, a really high level of, of poverty and homelessness in the West Midlands. Um, and so for me, it's really making sure that when we create programs that we're creating them with people so that we can shine a light on some of the stories. Um, we can really think about the state of the nation. Uh, we can have local global conversations and really put a sense of activism at the center of what we're doing so that we're always looking to both highlight some of these stories, but also think about the change that needs to happen and partnering with organizations, uh, third sector organizations, businesses, the art sector, schools um, and others in the city um, to help us make that change happen. So uh, I think we're the first year long festival um, that has really decided to be outcome driven. And so everything we're doing is about delivering those long term changes and outcomes that we want to see in the city. Uh, Aaron. Uh, so uh, I said earlier that I was um, doing this Zoom from Delfina Foundation. Um, we're precisely um, in central London, um, very close to Buckingham Palace. And every year we invite 40 artists to live and work in this space, in this house at the center kind of, of, kind of the UK government, uh, which was formerly a world empire, formerly a member of the EU, so all these kind of like things coalesce in this space and what we are exploring here is really the role of artists and also thinking about our neighbors, which are not normal neighbors in the sense that we have the royal family, government offices, lots of quangos and think tanks. And so we started to think about our work as an arts organization within this kind of language of actually, what are we thinking about here in this space? And we're thinking about the impact of art as it goes out into kind of the rest of the world. And our programs here tend to um, touch upon many different issues around social change from exploring issues related to the politics of food to looking at science and technology. So that's one part of my answer for you. The second part is as uh, a jury member for the Turner Prize this year and having the unbelievable challenge of trying to think through the shortlist at a time when there was very little kind of cultural activity happening in museums and galleries because for most of the year they were shut due to COVID. Um, so our task as a jury was to kind of think through kind of how do we come up with the list that kind of is of this moment and also reflects the, the huge kind of challenges that we've also been experiencing. And for us, it was thinking about uh, where people are, have been experiencing art and culture, that it, most likely wasn't in a museum and gallery, but it was out in a community context. Um, and, or it was in relation to 
kind of concerns that are very, very close to certain kind of to certain communities. And, and the way in which that type of art is produced and, and dis distributed is through collective action. And so our short list for this year, as you may all know, is a, a list of um, five collectives who work collaboratively, um, predominantly in different community contexts, looking at kind of broad range of social issues and, and challenges. And I think those are very evident in the exhibition at the Herbert, which Frances and her team there and, 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 and quite a lot of other contributors have made to have made happen uh, this year with a very kind of like extensive events and activities program. So it's not just about objects in a space, but it's about kind of what uh, the work of these collectives actually mean within their very specific context and how they could connect with Coventry. Great, thank you, Aaron. Uh, and Frankie. Thank you, Aaron. That's a really nice segue into uh, the Herbert. And we are extremely grateful um, for the shortlist because it absolutely aligns to um, the Herbert's thinking in terms of what we are as an institution. Um, when I took over as the director um, at the Herbert, it felt like institutions were extremely internalised, looking at creating programmes that with interest for people of the sector rather than people in general. And I've played around a lot with what the Herbert is. We're not, um, we're not a council organization, uh, but we are heavily funded by our city council, which means we do have a huge civic role to play. And um, I think that as we were going into 2021, there was this huge press pressure to create a program that was nationally significant that people would be watching and looking at. And I think we, we've always been um, an organisation that has uh, worked with, within our communities and tried to find platforms for our communities. But I think what became really clear and really strong as we went into um, COVID situations and contexts was that actually we can no longer play as a civic um, institution, the uh, neutral party that talks about, that doesn't take a role in taking sides, that creates this balanced approach, because by doing so, we're giving agency to what could be considered the harm or the injustice. And actually we fundamentally needed to find a way, a platform um, to create that collective action as Aaron called it, um whereby art could be that vehicle and actually 2021 what that meant for us is we had the spotlight of the nation and um we were uh, well we are being looked at nationally um in year of culture and what we're producing as one of the um cultural organizations in the city so it was our moment to put a um line in the sand or a flag in the ground whatever you want to call it to say no longer are we going to play a neutral role in what society um, has to say. And actually, Turner Prize has been that moment that has really pulled together some of those strands about um, where arts can play a role in social change. Absolutely. And we will continue those conversations in a really strong way. So, yeah, I think as an institution, we're no longer going to take that neutral line and we will be very brave and very strong in uh, where we align ourselves. Thank you. Great, thank you, Frankie. Uh, my daughter started singing very loudly in the bathroom next door. Uh, I'm just aware of that. Uh, give me a wave if you can hear her. <laughs> Super, great. <laughs> Um, cool. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask some questions for about kind of 20 minutes, I guess, and then, and then we'll move to a Q&A. Um, and I'll just remind people that they can use the Q&A function on Zoom. So if you have got a question, uh, chuck it in the Q&A box and, and we'll start to look through them as we get a little closer to the end of the session. Um, but let's, let's kick off by going kind of, uh, you know, we've got a kind of international array of attendees here today, just looking through some of the people saying hello. Uh, I wonder if we can say, why is Coventry the, the kind of cultural hub that we should all be looking to at this point in time? Let me start with you, Shanine. Yeah, so um, so in December 2017, uh, Coventry was um, 
uh, awarded the title of UK City of Culture. Um, we're the third city of culture in the UK. Um, it's a competition where a city becomes city of culture every four years and very much inspired by the European capital of culture. Um, and so since 2018, when I arrived in the city to lead the program, um, we've been thinking about what it is that um, we wanted to do. And it was very clear to me in arriving in the city that the city has a very strong history and heritage of activism. Um, from Lady Godiva through to uh, Two-Tone um, and everything in between. Um, and so we really wanted to pick up on that history and heritage. And it feels to me um, like we're going, we're in a decade now. I think, I think the 2020s is a decade of activism. It's going to be, it is already, and it will continue to be. There is so much going on in the world right now. Um, and it's crazy to think that here we are in the 21st century and there are still people in Western society without homes. Um, so I think there's a lot of work for us to do and artists are aligning with that, you know, they're members of communities and, and citizens as well and they see the poverty, they see the food banks, they see the homelessness, they see issues created by um, mental health, uh, poor mental health, um, they see the way in which people are struggling to live together in society in this world, the role that maybe technology has played in that as well and the impact that has. Um, and then on top of that, what's going on in the world with climate crisis, um, the movement of people all over the world fleeing from terror and conflict and destruction. Um, so we've got this massive uh, kind of um, global uh, decade ahead of us where I hope we can try to make some change happen. Um, and I think when we came into Coventry, you know, we could have just put a lovely festival on for a year but um, it wouldn't have been connected to the world. It wouldn't have been connected to our citizens. And actually, because we've put citizens at the center of all of our storytelling, these are the stories they wanna talk about. So really that's why Coventry has become this uh, hub because um, A, we've got this City of Culture program and, and during COVID, when uh, a lot of the arts and culture sector have really struggled, uh, we've had to keep going. Um, we've had to keep continuing to build and create our program. And actually it's become more important than ever to have arts and culture in our lives and, and to show the value that arts and culture has. Um, I would say that our program is powered by our citizens. Um, we're also just to say a Marmot city. So um, Richard Marmot um, has been leading a lot of work which looks at um, the health, um, how, how you can create a, a kind of more healthier society by tackling poverty. Um, and so there's a huge amount of work going on in the city through our third sector and our city council around that. Um, and I think we just really wanted this program that really kind of um, tackled social justice. We've got some incredible organizations in our city who work um, ferociously every day to look out for people um, and to um, campaign to government uh, to make lives, people's lives better. So um, it felt like the right place for this to be. Um, so I think that's why we're here. Um, and I think what you'll see from our programme, if you, if you look um, at what we've been trying to do, has been trying to create programme that has some cut through, um, that really does speak to some of these big issues around social justice. Um, but also um, that people can come and enjoy uh, that's playful, bit of mischief making. Um, so there's a little bit of, of that as well, um, but really thinking about a manifesto for the future. Um, and as Aaron said, the, the, the artists in the Turner Prize absolutely um, em, embody, you know, the, the spirit of what we're, we're, we're aiming to do here and, and our ambition. Thank you. Maybe we should go to Aaron next. Well, I was just going to say, I think there's, it was a great kind of like uh, synergy. Um, so when we, as a jury, sat down to um, think through the shortlist, um, we never in our wildest dreams would have kind of expected these kind of connections to, to have taken shape. So it was kind of a, it was a list that was meant to be, I think, for this year, but I think it was just coming from this moment where actually wherever we were and everyone has been in the world, I mean, we cannot ignore the huge kind of uh, social issue that has been raised kind of up 
because of the pandemic. Also the environmental crisis at the same time. So our response kind of with the short list kind of was reflecting in a way these issues, but also unbeknownst to us, connecting very much to kind of Coventry's kind of history of activism. And then when we looked at it in hindsight, after it was, you know, there was approval by all the various bodies for the short list, we saw how it made such an excellent fit, given that the artists are exploring issues that relate to kind of freedom of expression, to neurodiversity, to gender, to the environment, all issues that are global, but at the same time resonate on such kind of a local level. And I think that's what kind of this ne next day, decade is also about, is identifying ways to work in solidarity, to create spaces of care, to nurture kind of new ideas can, that can solve some of these massive problems that we have to, to tackle in, in the world. And the only way to do that is by working together. And so the, the Tenor Prize list is kind of raising those kind of issues. And I think for it to be based kind of in Coventry at this moment, when the whole capital of culture kind of campaign has been looking at ways in which it can embed the notion of culture within the community and can resonate change from that through outputs, as, as already was said, not just fluff, but actually through outputs. Um, I think it's just a really incredible uh, kind of moment that these things have kind of coalesced. Um, but I think things happen for a reason. Thanks. Frankie, nodding in agreement. Yeah, so I think um, whether by design or by accident, uh, the the themes of Turner Prize and uh, the artists that have been nominated and the work that is produced by the nominees and the subsequent programs have been absolutely central to reaching into communities and um, uh, speaking to some of the key concerns that the hub has been addressing for some time now. Um, but uh, what we're what we're feeling is that. Um, a lot of the comments have been oh my god the Herbert's doing something relevant again and that is exactly what I was speaking to um, in my introduction is that you know institutions have been so inwardly focusing they haven't heard the room and now it's our opportunity to hear the room and to hear people and I think what happened during lockdown and this whole year of um, or 18 months even nearly two years of Covid is that those social injustices have really come to the surface in a in a really loud way um and activism has become stronger i felt um and i think what's true to say is that um what coventry can offer as a hub to go back to your question and i have a small child <laughs> wanting to join the conversation which i said would happen is that you know, as a as a global entity, Coventry has twenty seven uh, twin countries that we um, can, so any uh, and we call our program hyper hyper local, globally connected. That's one of our key business aims um, or key institutional aims. And actually, the very diversity of the city is our strength as a as a cultural hub. Is because we have more than 100 languages spoken in our schools. We're a city of refuge, uh, which means that if you are um, coming to the, if you are entering into the country, that we're one of the first cities that you might land in. And so it's really important for cultural institutions to not only tell the stories of new communities and raise some of those global issues and in a really loud way with a really clear platform. It's also about supporting um, those communities into uh, finding their feet, finding their place um, and re and reestablishing themselves in, in whichever way culturally that is appropriate um, to them. And just feeding back into uh, some of the conversations that Shanine was raising around co-curation and co-authorship. You can't do that as an institution if you're being neutral. You can only do that if you're providing platforms and voices that create discourse and conversation and debate and every single one of those nominees that have been a part of Turner Prize have landed with our hey we're here this is what we want to talk about and everyone has created that discussion and and, and that um uh uncomfortable comfortable conversation if that makes sense I don't know if that does it's a bit of a a, a mismatch of uh, words but has been challenging 
but in a really um, great way that has created really relevant conversations and dialogue. So that's why Co Coventry should be looked at as a cultural hub right now, is because we're having those relevant dialogues in a really loud platform. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Chris, you, you opened a show in Coventry, uh, so it's clearly got strong resonances with, with the work of Cardboard Citizens. Um, what does it mean for you? I think what was interesting is is watching loads of different things when I was when I was up there in Coventry, going going to the Turner Prize, uh, watching a watching a flash mob happen in the middle of the uh, the city centre, which was completely joyous, <clears throat> and 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 then just sort of being engaged and watching the choir in the community choir that were <clears throat> put together by um, <clears throat> Underground Lights, um, which was a, a homeless homeless choir. People with lived experience of homelessness, and and they and uh, what I thought was amazing about what everybody here in in this room uh, on the panel have, have, have been able to synthesize is is this complete connectivity between loads of different generations and loads of different uh, groups of people, and actually to prove, oh look, well, you know, look, this is this is how we do it, and this is this is. Um, this is joyous actually you know there's a lot of seriousness and a lot of us talking about activism and, and all of that stuff but actually sometimes I think that joy I mean that that five minutes of flash mob in the, in, in the city center with some Irish dancing and some uh, <laughs> mad uh, choreography was was actually one of the most revolutionary things I'd seen actually because there was a moment where it felt you know tangible it, it, it was powerful we could we could we could feel that activism but but it was it was there saying actually do you know what the world's trying to get us down and we're just gonna have a little dance for a moment and just seeing that that be uh created by all by and, and then being in the turner prize and seeing so many different people i mean you know i'm i was lucky enough to to grow up in in london where there's so many different galleries and 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 stuff that you can you can access for free uh not that i did if i'm being honest but <laughs> but but they were there but actually to walk into 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 the Herbert and see see so many different generations of people watch looking at the Turner Prize and, and and doing the voting system and all of that stuff. I mean that all of that for me, I feel is, you know, transferable to loads of different different places, but but it but it needs all of the heart and the souls of people that are in this in this room to put put that together and 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 engage with the community. So I think that's why it's important. Um, it's the people, isn't it, really? And I think one of, one of the other things that kind of really marks out kind of like this list and again, also connects this conversation, but um, I'm just going to go back to the short list for the Turner Prize a little bit to say that these are kind of collectives that really embed themselves in the community. They work with the community over a very long period of time. They're really attached to these issues. And going back to what I said earlier about how we need to foster more networks of solidarity, you can only do that if you are embedding yourself deep into a context, right? And then you can rise up and connect and join up. But there's kind of the, 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 the depth in that kind of cardboard citizens and, and many of the Turner Prize, or well, actually all of the Turner Prize uh, nominees kind of have been doing is kind of like that kind of, um, I don't say the grit, right? Because also <laughs> just trying to use a very accessible language here. The grit that's kind of like needed to kind of like move kind of things forward to kind of like, um, anyway, just to add a little bit about that. Yeah, Frankie. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. I've only had two years to sort this out. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, just to come in there is that, yeah, it, it, um, art for social change doesn't happen overnight. It's not, it shouldn't be and isn't a flash in the pan. It's not fashionable. It's not of, the mo of a moment. It's actually embedded and deep um, work, way of working. And I think that's why um, it's perhaps a little bit difficult for people to understand why we would do that work and um but it's it's crucial that it is embedded and that the it is the people who are affected by the need for social change king but in order to do that you have to give confidence and enable and facilitate and to collaborate and all of those words that we know are the the best way best practice in order for social change to happen, because I can't speak for, um, I can't speak for uh, Gentle Radical, I can't speak for Array Collective, I can't speak for Bass, I can't speak for Project Artworks, and I can't speak for Cooking Sections, even though some of those strains are deep work that I've been involved in, I'm not at that coalface, I am not experiencing those injustices, 
but I can provide the platform and I can provide the space to talk and to to create and I think that's as an institution is is something that is um um it's it's needed um institutions need to let go of that power balance and allow the um the voices and uh, the aren't curators to speak um yeah I just wanted to say that thank you I just wanted to quickly pick up on um, what Chris was saying, and I think it's it's really important. You know, when we were planning our program, um, we absolutely wanted to create a year of joyful celebration. Um, but that shouldn't stop you from also doing something powerful, um, hard hitting and something that can really deliver change. And I think the important thing is to find that right balance so that within every program and project or event, uh, there are layers uh, to, to each of those. Um, and people can come in or whatever layer they want. They can come and just dance, or they can come and they can get involved in, 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 a, in a kind of deeper, more engaged way. And I think that's what we've tried to do. And I feel that um, there's still um, a bit of an issue when you talk about working with communities and citizens that people think it's going to be poor quality, it's not going to be very good, <laughs> all these things. And actually what we've demonstrated, I think, in the first six months of our, of our program is that you can work with a whole range of partners uh, when you're creating events that are driven by communities and they can be really powerful. And quality is one of those very difficult words but for me it's more about uh the narrative uh and and the way in which people come together to deliver those projects um and and the joy that that gives people so our our uh, mantra was always from the beginning to create a joyful program with a deep social conscience um and i think that's what we've really tried to stick to all the way through um as well as you know being uh playful and and curious and all those other all those other things thanks thank you yeah sorry just to um, come in on that on the hitting, hitting issues is there is joy in some of those hard issue, hitting issues um turner prize has gone way beyond my expectation and be able to engage with human interaction and we've had tears at some of the uh programming but tears of tears of joy where um participants with selective mutism have actually stood up in front of audiences that are not closed audiences this is people who are just entering into the gallery spaces talking about their lives who have been mute for years selective mutes for years um so there is those there are hard hitting and joyful moments too and i agree with shanine exactly what she's saying is that community art has this reputation for being a little bit ah oh, you know we get an ah oh, moment but actually no let's let's put this on a platform that is uh, absolutely when we talk about quality yes when we're co-curating with communities there is the fear factor of what are we going to be presenting at the end but let's get over ourselves I've seen amazing community projects that stand up against uh, practicing artists that are considered at the top of their career so let's just take the leap of faith and engage and get people creating. It feels, it feels like everyone's talking a lot about kind of um, about this decade and this year maybe being quite different from from what's come before. Is, is that true and, and 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 why is that? Why does it feel so acute now? I should, uh, Shinny, nodding. I mean, I think when I, when I arrived in Coventry in 2018, um, someone told me that they'd been doing some research in the city and 50% of Coventrians um, declared that they had some form of mental health related issue. That's nearly 200,000 people. Like that is a huge figure, that is a pandemic. <laughs> in one city, that is a pandemic. Um, and so how can we create programs um, festivals, events, art uh, initiatives, when we know that that many people are going to struggle to engage or be involved. And um, the same with some of the other, um, you know, big areas of work that are going on in the city, you know, it's, it, it, there's so much going on on the ground and how do we get that cut through and engagement and what is it that people need to kind of talk about? And so, 
Um, I think there was a quote, there's someone mentioned in the chat that uh, mental health is fashionable, but maybe it is fashionable, but actually lots of people have issues with mental health. Um, and we shouldn't be ignoring that. We should be trying to open that discussion up and uh, discuss it in lots of different ways because it affects different people in different ways. We've, we've seen it through the work that Chris and the team did in the city um, with, our, with, our, um, with, with our homeless communities. We've seen it with young people. Uh, we've seen it with older people. You know, there's a, and I don't think COVID has helped you know, with the isolation um, that that's created and, 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 the, and the increased challenges as well. So, um, so for me, it's so important that we understand what is going on in our society. You know, we're not in the 1970s anymore, we're in the 2020s. Um, we're just, we've just commissioned some, some work with the BBC, a, a new TV series, which is looking at poverty and homelessness and a kind of a state of the nation TV series. And what the reason that I wanted to co-commission that is because I want to change the narrative. I want to open up the discussion um, and change the way people think about it, because I think we still think in the way we did in the 1970s when we think about poverty. Um, and it's, it's so... Um, there are so many reasons and there are so many uh, ways in which people find themselves struggling. Um, it, it's not like one or two things, probably wasn't in the 70s either. Um, but we need to have a much more sophisticated conversation and a more sophisticated uh, dialogue about what is going on and why people find themselves in a particular place. And that goes from children and young people who are in the care system or um, or struggling for different reasons up until kind of old age and adults in, in kind of social care. So I feel like we, we need to be having these conversations in order to understand each other, in order to give people power, to give them a voice, a platform. Um, and, and, you know, if we're gonna build society, uh, we need a society that is caring. Um, and you can't be caring if you don't really understand what is going on around you. Um, you know, many people will never have some of these issues or, or even come up face to face with them. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't know about them and understand them and, and engage with them. So for me, that was kind of one of the reasons why I really wanted us to have more of a focus on this in our program um, so that we really spread a much greater understanding um, and really help to support that care that we need to see in our society. And you know, I've been watching some of the, um, the, the TV uh, films that are coming through from this series and um, it all comes down to care and love and understanding. Um, so much can be healed in society with that. So hopefully we, we make, make a little bit of an indent into some of the thinking around that. Thank you. I should um, I should move on to some of our questions from the from the attendees now as well. Um, daughter still singing nonstop. Uh, I guess this one is, is kind of a, a natural follow on. Actually, how do we guarantee that the agency and empowerment that has emerged in Coventry in twenty twenty one is sustained once the city of culture moves on? Sorry, I jump in and Frankie, maybe you can jump in as well. Um, I mean, I suppose our approach has been to embed, to be embedded. So um, when we came in, we've set up, um, I don't want to go into too much technical detail, but we have three producing teams in our organisation. Um, so one of them is our Caring City team, and they're all um, named after global movements. So the Caring City movement um, started in South Africa. Um, and it's really about um, how you think about the different needs of people in order to make sure people are included and that you're removing barriers and really considering uh, the challenges that people face in their lives. Um, and each of those producers is embedded in a charity in the city. So it's very much kind of understanding what's already going on and looking at how our program to, can support that and, and build on that and develop that and, and support those charities to deliver against their objectives using uh, arts and culture to do that. And in the process, passing on an understanding to those charities of how they might work with artists, the commissioning process, uh, but also the role of communities in that. Um, our second team is the Collaborative City team. And again, this is a global movement um, and, and uh, it started in America actually. 
Um, and this is very much about cultural democracy. This is about co-creation. Uh, this is about people having a say in, the, in, in what is going on around them. It's about power sharing. Uh, it's about decision making. And so we have a team of producers who work in the community with libraries and schools and local businesses, um, uh, community centers, community radio stations, you know, those places where cultural democracy is alive that's where our producers are working so again it's about supporting that work and growing it but also um, you know bringing new ideas to the table and raising the ambition and thinking about the change that we want to see and then our third producing team is the dynamic city uh, team again it's another global movement started in Europe um, very much aligned to livable cities and smart cities that kind of thing um, where it's looking to the future and thinking about how we can make the change that we want to see for the future of our families. So whether it's the green future or digital future, whether it's about the role of young people. So again, it's kind of thinking about, um, well, we've been kind of embedding ourselves with universities, with the city council, um, and with many different partners, kind of wildlife partners, environmental partners, so that we're really embedded and we're supporting the work that's already happening rather than coming in and creating our own. Um, the only way of legacy is through people. Um, and so our investment in people is, is the biggest thing we can do. So investment in community, investment in artists, investment in um, organisations that we're working with. Uh, whether they're charities or whether they're um, agencies. Um, it's very much about the way in which we work with them in order to, to enable them to continue that work after our city of culture. So that's really how we've approached it. And um, in fact, we're just doing some legacy planning at the moment. And so much of our work is being taken forward now in the city by partners. You know, I, I, don't, I don't feel worried that we're going to leave and everything's going to kind of drop off the edge of the planet that actually... Um, there's a huge amount that will continue to go forward. So uh, it feels like that's been the strongest way to embed legacy, really. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to, Frankie, did you want to jump in? I'm, I'm just aware we've got a considerable amount of questions. Um, no, I can go to the next question. That's fine. Super. Thank you. Uh, so Amy Howard, uh, I think this might be the Amy Howard I was sat with uh, two days ago in Manchester, uh, says, what different measures of success have the different organisations been using regarding civic engagement and activism? So what are those kind of KPIs for, for people? I suppose we are um, in, in, in Holden. Is that the correct terminology? I don't know. We um, what uh, I think an artist put it to me you're in a you're in the middle of a hard spot in terms of what data you're collating because you're collating data for stakeholders and not necessarily data for yourself and I I get that and actually what we try to do is a bit of both um provide a narrative um in terms of KPIs that goes uh numerical data but also some of that soft data as well about impact to people's lives and what that means going forward um one of the things that I was going to say around Shanine's um, uh, how do we embed work is that that data is really important, but it's not the num numerical data that will embed this activity. It's the it's the soft data. It's the I, you know, that those um, it's those uh, narratives around um, where we come across one person who couldn't enter our space because it was too overwhelming, there was too many sensory moments and we created a, a quiet space for that person to come in and be able to talk to us about why they couldn't use our services. So I think uh, in terms of KPIs, we're quite lucky in that, um, yes, there's a lot of numerical information that's important to stakeholders such as funders, the number of people through the door, um, bums on seats, that's always going to be a pressure, but actually, Arts Council policies moving towards more of that co-curation, those co-authorships, co which doesn't come from numerical data, that comes from that quality of information. So we've got to be better at capturing that. And I think this year of culture means that we are afforded that opportunity to embed ourselves and have some of those narratives that are then fed back to be heard with funders around not just wanting how many people came through your door, but some of those 
um, harder to capture narratives. And I've worked in arts and health and that, you know, capturing enjoyment is incredibly difficult because you don't know what kind of journey somebody had to your venue before they had the experience. You don't know what's going on in their wider life. Um, um, uh, and so contact. So, yeah, it's yeah. In terms of your KPIs, I think we're really lucky for City of Culture, there is a requirement for both. And I think the most important narrative is gonna be more about the impact than it is about bums on seats. And I think that is the silver lining of the C word, which is COVID, is that um, people are much more about what the impact is and they've realized that audiences aren't necessarily that people walk through your door. They could be somebody that you meet in the street and have a conversation with. It could be somebody that engages with you digitally. It could be somebody that engages with you as a participant. We do need to change that narrative properly though. It can't just be at grass levels. It has to be systemic from funders through to stakeholders, through to boards and then um, at grassroots as well. And another key point is that often, you know, there's this expectation that, you know, uh, that things will happen immediately. It also takes time. Because we, we have been talking about embedded practices. We've been talking about longevity, care. These things take time. And so we have to, in terms of funding language, kind of get, um, a, a, you know, really kind of try to reflect that within how we capture data, that it has to be over amount of time. And that we have to see how these things can resonate and, and make an impact in someone's life over a period of time. This is just, just, just rush, this immediacy that's expected all the time. I think that's one thing that maybe COVID has also changed a little bit is our, our, of our kind of um, understanding of time. You know, it's been collapsing and expanding as we all know around us, but actually how do we kind of allow space for breathing, space for reflection, space for understanding. These are urgent issues, yes, but also they just take time. And so I'm just compressing that, that, that word, the four letter word time, it's so incredibly important in terms, in terms of all the work that we're doing. Um, one year is a short amount of time, but actually the impact is one year of culture, probably decades of impact is gonna come from this one year. And I think sort of, you know, both Frank, Frankie and uh, my other kind of panelists would agree to that. Impact isn't demonstrated in an hour of uh, facilitated workshops. That doesn't happen. It doesn't. You might have one workshop that is amazingly brilliant, fantastic, well done, great. But actually, what goes on from there, the spider grammar fact of impact is actually what we should be measuring. And that is difficult to measure because it's longitudinal and it's making sure you keep contact. It's making sure that that level of activity remains and that there are multiple to access and engage in it's hard um, and that's why probably people shy away from that, access, that activity, um, but it's, it's important to infect change. Thank you. Um, Can I just add something in, just, yeah. um, just, uh, just from our perspective as City of Culture, we've been working very closely with both universities, uh, University of Warwick and Coventry University, and we created um, what's uh, very dryly called a theory of change, which we now are calling our story of change. And really what we did right at the beginning is we worked with all organisations in the city, including the city council, to really think about the long-term journey of the city. And we agreed on four long-term impacts um, that we would be measured against. Um, and, then, and then to deliver those impacts, there are 15 outcomes. So our whole programme delivers against those 15 outcomes in the kind of short to medium term in order to get to the four long-term uh, uh, impacts. So I think for, from my perspective, that's really exciting because actually we're all going in the same direction. It's not just about city of culture, it's a city journey. Um, you know, city of culture is a city change program. So it's very much all of us working together. So the charitable sector are working in that way as well. All of the city council departments are, uh, the universities um, and the arts sector too. So it feels like, and, and that's also connected to the cultural strategy. So, um, so it feels very powerful. And I think when we do, when we start to do the kind of evaluation reports and, and start to publish those, um, I think you'll start to see kind of the impact that it's had, but that will be a long term, a long term piece of work. Thanks. Um, I've got about four minutes of questions left, so I might, I might just kind of offer this up for whoever wants to grab it. Uh, Pinar Aksu says, what do you think is the role of creativity in achieving social change? Are there any concrete examples and how do you ensure voices of the experiences 
are at the center. I'll give it a go. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting talking about how we're in this moment of change this year has been, or, or last year has been this moment of flux where everybody's sort of woken up, I suppose. And, 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 and actually I think it's an, it's an interesting uh, friction actually, because I, I grew up in poverty in, in center of London uh, and, and was homeless a couple of times. Uh, through my, throughout my childhood and went from benefit class to criminal class to, to, to working class and all, all, all of that in between. And so I was sort of acutely aware, I think, of all of those situations before, before we ever got into this situation. So it is about a lived experience. And I think, you know, there's this idea, ideology a little bit like Black Lives Matter happened just after George Floyd because it, it didn't. It, I mean, it has been happening for decades and decades and decades before that. But there has been this moment where we've been here together in this, this shared trauma, I suppose, of COVID that has enabled us all to, most of us, to, to wake up and to, <laughs> and to at least try and do something, which, which is great. But some of us were already semi-awake or, or, or very awake to, to all of those situations. Um, but as I, as I say, you know, the thing is, is, growing up in those situations, I know I was on a particular path, and this is just a, a, about me as a, as, a, as a person, but if, I mean, you know, to put it, to put it bluntly, I was on, on, a, on a situation at the very worst, which would, would have probably ended up in prison, if not um, uh, working in a, in, a, in a sort of low income, possibly manual labor work, job, which is absolutely fine. But art was introduced to me, it gave me a voice, it gave me a moment for us, for me to say this isn't fair actually this this stuff that's happening in my life isn't fair and it is and it's responsible people are responsible for this people that are in charge governments and people people that own housing associations and all of that all of that stuff the people that are, are betraying a whole class a whole group of 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 people and and i'm going to make work about that i want as an artist i feel like i'm going to hold people accountable through throughout my work but not only is that trying to change the world slightly through my work but it's already changed my world the, the people that have given me opportunities from one step to the next have been able to change my world and I think that art and social change is also about the individual sometimes we, we, a lot of time we think about what is the societal shift that we've done but actually the societal shift just for somebody trying to engage this 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 boy from a council estate at school in drama lessons to 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 to, to have a voice has 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 immeasurably changed the world and the world around me actually and so i think that that is a, a legitimate tangible a tangible outcome and you know also we've got to remember the other thing i wanted to say a little while back about activism is it's absolutely right that we should be putting activism up on on a, on, a, on a pedestal but activism works both ways and and actually you've got to be careful you have to hold people in in different places because we we might see some people now um protesting about being anti-lockdown or anti-mask or or, or anti-vaccination which is activism to them you know to, to those people and whether we think that's right or wrong you know that we, we have a responsibility to also understand what is good and and what is bad and, and where, where we sit morally when it comes to activism as well we can't just throw that to the side we have to also acknowledge the badness in the world because we'd love to live in a utopia but we don't and, and understanding that and being absolutely truthful is a way that we can really fight it. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm going to be cheeky and squeeze one more question in uh, with my eye on the clock. So uh, for Francis, what was the process of reconciling institutional knowledge, making the shift from neutrality to a position against harm? There's a barrier of intelligibility in that things are acceptable until they are not, that the Herbert seems to have overcome. That's uh, from Alan Lynn in Newcastle. Well, firstly, it's great that you think we've overcome that. I think it's a daily discussion and debate. It goes back to what Chris was saying about, you know, that um, people who are anti-mask or anti-vaccination feel that that is a, a, a legitimate um, um, activism. And, and, and who is we, an institution, to say they are wrong? I think what what we try to do is find those narratives where there where there feels like there's an absolute that we can um, align to our core values. So I think that aligns totally to um, the work that we engage with. Um, it's about knowing 
as an organization what your core values are and having that as a systemic approach from top to bottom there is no point in me talking about um you know uh black lives matter or um outsider art or uh disability or um how we're going to work in in communities to co-curate if my board aren't interested in co-curation as a as a narrative so uh, as a as a journey we've been on a huge journey and it hasn't been an easy journey let's be really frank here and um, I'm known for my transparency and um, my little bit of controversy accidental controversy is that we've we've had a long journey and a long battle in terms of convincing people that this is the right way to work we are absolutely now in line uh, to be collaborators, not institutions. I'd really like to debunk the fact that the Herbert is an institution. I can't hide behind the fact that we're an organisation and that we have funders behind us. I can't hide behind the fact that we are a certain type of organisation. We've been accused of being a white organisation with a white language. Yes, we are. But actually, what can I do? What is within the realms of not just me, but my team and um, my board and my SLT and all of those? And I'm using the word my, I realise that, uh, uh, possessing that. Um, but it's absolutely about we can acknowledge as an institution where we stand in our fallacies. But actually, it's about finding strategies to provide space for other voices and um, changing that as is imperative in order for me to change what we are and then hopefully that has a ripple effect for the organ uh, for the sector um yeah i don't really know what else to say on that it's a it's a really tricky one because i don't we've only really entered into this for the last two years if people think we've got it right amazing but from internally we're still fighting the fight we're still pushing the barriers we're still entering into landmines we're still having those challenging conversations where it's uncomfortable challenge but if you don't get into that space, you're never going to affect change. I think I'm going to just, I'm just kind of applaud kind of like Frankie, because I think part of it is about being honest and acknowledging the fact that it is not easy, you know, because easy is just to go back to what was in place before, right? That's easy. That's comfortable because it doesn't cause any confrontation. But this is the more difficult with a more kind of a forward kind of like thinking route and just being as transparent as possible and just saying, I don't have the answer. Are we going to do this together? Is the kind of right kind of approach? Because it's about saying, you know, I understand what your perspective is. Let me tell you where mine is. Let's kind of go forth together. Um, so I just want to kind of kind of just uh, give a little kind of applaud to, applause to uh, Frankie for kind of that, that, that answer and how the Herbert is, has been tackling this entire kind of process. Thank you. And I think um, what's really important is my lived experience of what it's like to be on the outside. I've always said, oh, you know, I'm an outsider because X, X and X. No, I became an outsider when I mistakenly went to a deaf, hard of hearing event without an interpreter thinking I would just middle, muddle through. I did not muddle through. I was not involved in conversation. I was on the edge trying to put my hand up, trying to edge into conversation. And it was hard. And that experience made me realize that actually, who am I? <laughs> who are you? And actually, there is no other space for my voice if I'm talking about um, how to affect change and how to engage uh, non audience however you want to term this, whether it be cultural democracy, whether you call it social practice, whether you call it outside insider art, whatever your narrative is around that, that isn't for me to say and to have the the voice it is for me to provide the space for others to speak um and i'm really really strong on that and that's what i press upon my team is you don't know it doesn't i don't care if you've done a project for eight years you don't know until you have either experienced what it is to be on the outside or until a person tells you what they want or what they need or whatever it might be um, and I'm really, really clear on that as a as a, a, a framework and a way forward. And I and I take that approach with my board. I take that approach with my SLT. Is you don't know. We don't know. We don't have the answer, and we don't have a right. Others do, and we have to provide the the space and the right and give permission. Um, because as institutions, we do have to give permission. And Turner Prizes absolutely opened my eyes to that because I thought that communities knew that the Herbert was for them. 
but when we were working with the communities we've worked with for ages they would thank you so much for inviting me of joy but a moment of sadness because why would I need you why would I need to invite you into town of prize you use the herb but we work with you why do I need to give you an invitation and actually yeah that is exactly still the space that we're in so we still have a long journey so thank you for saying that we've done a good job we've got a long road to travel Chris I, I was just I've just given a round of applause to that really it's, it's the truth of the matter <laughs> Super, thank you. Um, uh, because of because uh, we are at time, uh, I'm going to say thank you to the attendees for their for their brilliant questions, and thank you all for your uh, insightful and very honest answers as well. Um, I'd love the transparency. Uh, Chris, do you want to tell us a little bit about the Big Give Christmas Challenge fundraising campaign? You get my uh, presenter voice on. Uh, <laughs> um, this year, Carble Citizen is taking part in the Big Give Christmas Challenge with the aim of vital funds towards our year round programme of creative workshops and support for people affected by homelessness. For one week, from the 30th of November to the 7th of December, donations made to Carble Citizens via our Big Give campaign page will be matched. Uh, the campaign opens at 12 midday tomorrow. Um, please click uh, the link that gets sent to you. Um, and donate if you can and our donations will be doubled um we desperately we desperately need uh, more money to be able to do what we what we do as as do all arts organizations at the moment but things are getting cut um awfully but also uh what we need to put out in the world it has, has doubled quadrupled sometimes um and we're in a moment of flux so anything that you can give from five pounds to, to however much would be Grateful, uh, gratefully received. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and absolutely, uh, it's more important is it that if whatever they give, it's going to be doubled. And I think that yeah, that's within this week. So I think that's uh, that's really exciting. Um, we've got a very short post event survey for you to fill in, and that will be emailed to uh, all attendees tomorrow, I believe. Uh, so you can let us know what you thought of the conversation. We'd be really grateful to receive any thoughts that you had. Um, we look forward to keeping you up to date on the future Cardboard Citizens events and how you can create change with us. Thank you to our wonderful panellists, uh, Chris, Aaron, Frankie, Shanine. Uh, I think that's us over and out. Thank you all for joining. Good night.